All right, good evening. Thank you so much for coming today. Today's the, this week is the fifth in our webinar series, um, exploring people's history, uh, looking at different methodology and genres. Today, we have Dr. Valerie Mashman, uh, who will be talking about stories of history from a Borneo longhouse uh, genre and method. I'm Rusaslina Idrus. I'm a board member of the Satsya Rakyat, and I'll be moderating uh, today's presentation. Uh, we're so happy to have uh, Dr. Valerie, who's also been uh, you know, following uh, and been part of the conversation in our webinar series. So we're very uh, delighted to have her here today to present her work. Valerie is currently an Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Borneo Studies, University of Malaysia, Sarawak researching social memories uh, attached to the forts of the Upper Baram River. She was a research fellow at the Sarawak Museum Campus and Heritage Trail Project from 2017 to 2018, looking at material culture in museums um, from the era of peacemaking. Her research interests in the field of anthropology examine, issue, examine issues of oral history and narratives, values and social change, indigeneity, gender and material culture with a particular focus on indigenous peoples of Borneo. She has published extensively on Borneo studies in various publications, and her presentation today will give us a glimpse uh, of a book that she has just completed. So we look forward to reading your book, Valerie. Also, we, uh, you know, following Valerie uh, as uh, sort of the format of our webinar series, we have uh, Professor Diana Wong, who will act as a discussant. Uh, Professor Diana is a board member of Pisat Rakyat and was engaged in a PSR project to develop a methodology for the exploration and documentation of a history from below on the basis of personal um, uh, of a history from below project on the basis of personal shared and collective memory. Her academic training is in the sociology of development and her research interests have been in the field of migration and religion. She is currently the Dean of Graduate, uh, Graduate School at the New Era University College in Kajang. So thank you uh, to both of you for being here. Thank you to the audience. So we look forward to a very exciting uh, presentation and then we'll uh, follow, follow it by discussion by Dr. De, uh, Dr. Professor Diana. And then uh, I'll open it up for uh, all the uh, participants here. So feel free to write your questions in the chat room. And if you want to ask verbally, you can also uh, indicate that. Okay, I leave it to you, Valerie. I think you have some slides to share. You can uh, start that now. Thank you. Dr. Valerie Mashman. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my talk today is stories of history from a Borneo longhouse. And I'm going to be talking about genre and method. I'm not going to talk so much about content and meaning. Um, okay, I'm just... Maybe I... you try and use your keyboard. Oh, Carol, use my keyboard. keyboard. Maybe. Yeah. Keyboard is frozen on me. Or oh, I, I think Sorry. on the bottom left, there seems to be some arrows there. Yeah, I'm that's exactly what I'm doing. It worked before. Billy, do you want to Why? Um, stop sharing? Because I think what you, you're sharing your laptop again instead of the PowerPoint. So maybe uh, just stop share and then choose oh. again. Oh, I know. I, I think you're in Zoom, but you need to be in PowerPoint. Okay, just stop. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So how do I do that? I stop share. Yeah. And then what do I do next? And then when you are choosing the... I, I, choosing what to share, choose the PowerPoint. So I stop share. I'm in PowerPoint. So, uh, okay. Um, you go to the screen. Are you, 
Can you see my screen? Uh, we can see you right now. But you're not seeing my screen. Hello? Uh, no, no, we're not seeing your screen. <laughs> I swear we we practiced this a couple of times <laughs> and it worked. I swear it happens to me all the time. <laughs> okay, so now I go to share screen, okay? Yeah. Sorry, everyone, uh, we'll get this in a minute. Yeah, no, no way. Okay, share. Oh, yes. Okay, now I go on to... Um, PowerPoint mode. And now I want to go on to the next slide. Okay. This is an outline of my talk, everyone. Um, I'm going to first of all show you the location of the field site, the Calabit Long House of Long Pal One. I'll then sh share with you how I got hold of the narratives and what they're about. Then I'm going to talk about the Austronesian heritage as I learned about the genre of oral historical narratives from looking at um, Austronesian examples. I look at definitions and I look at features of historical narratives. I'll touch on meaning and value and then we'll go on to method. Um, I'm just getting the hang of this. It's, oh dear, next. Okay, this is the field site and um, um, I'm supposed to be getting, okay, I don't know if you can see the pointer. This is Long Puluan, a Calabit longhouse in the upper Baram River. The neighbors of the Long Puluan people are a group, very small group called the Saban who stay here in the Longbanga area and there are Penan at Long Lamai and Long Baruang. Other groups that um, are touched on in the, in the narratives are the Kenya Badang at Liomatu and the Ngorek at Long Simiang. My journey, my research journey, took me from the headwaters of the Baram River all the way up to Marudi, uh, which was the ancient capital of the district, where in our narratives, our heroes go to Marudi to meet representatives from the Brunei regime. And then on to Miri, where a lot of the longhouse diaspora live today. I was also lucky enough to be able to go over the border and make connections with um, related peoples on the Karayan River. Mm, dear. Sorry. This is the word. Um, so I received the longhouse narratives in a moment of serendipity. One day in 2010, I was visiting Long Poluan, which is my husband's longhouse. And as I, I was an unexpectedly given three cassette tapes and a tape recorder and complete with batteries. Milian Tapun, the narrator of Long Poluan, wanted me to listen to three narratives he'd recorded for his eldest son, Beric. Sadly, Beric had since deceased. Melian's motive for circulating these narratives was so that his other sons and the wider community would know why things are the way they are. The narratives are what he calls traitor sajara or stories of history. He uses Malay terms as there seem to be no other terms of this genre in circulation among the Calabit. This may be because since the Calabit became Christian in the 1930s to 1950s, they in their words broke with the past. And so then none of these um, narratives left at present. And so I realized that these narratives were really quite important enough to consider writing up to, as a PhD. But the burning question I had to myself were, were these mere stories or were they a real contribution to history? So what are the narratives, are, what are they about? Um, I'll give you a little bit about the context. Melian, the narrator, is wrestling with challenges towards or to his authority brought about by changes caused by logging and road building. He tells the narratives which affirm the roots and values and extent of his ancient community. His stories of histories, Trita Sajara, 
show how his people have worked to achieve a life that is good, living free from fear in a place where land is good and food is plentiful. The first narrative describes warfare, separations, migration, and alliances with our people and journeys to safe, to journeys in search of safe and fertile land. And by cross-references, we can work out that the time span is around the early 1800s. The second narrative centers on living what he calls the life of government, as ancestor hero Tai Wan journeys to interact with the Brunei and Brook state to take part in a punitive expedition against enemies in Dutch Borneo and initiate peacemaking and build a fort. And this is about the 1870s to 1900s. And the third narrative located in the 1930s deals with the life of prayer, Olun Sambayan, as Sotapun, the narrator's father, goes to Dutch Borneo to find missionaries to teach his people about Christian prayer. The new converts in turn encouraging, encourage the neighboring Penang to settle and learn about Christianity. So um, I'm going on to the Austronesian background and the Austronesian language group is thought to have come from Taiwan and mainland China. And there are over 240 million speakers of Austronesian languages, ranging from Madagascar, Indonesia, the Philippines, to New Zealand and Hawaii. And um, the people at Long Pulwan speak Calabit, Saban, Kenya Lapoke, and their Austronesian languages. The timing of the Austronesian dispersal is said to go back some 6,000 years, although there's some debate over the origins of dispersal. The Austronesian heritage is manifest in the material culture of the long houses of Borneo, the great houses of the Taraja, and the Minangkabau houses of Sumatra. And the Austronesian house represents an intangible cultural category which defines the social group, which identifies with it. And um, I'm very grateful to the pioneering work of James Fox, who did a lot of work on uh, the Austronesians from the Australian National University in the 18, 1980s and 1990s. In Sarawak, longhouse communities represent much more than a physical dwelling place. For example, for the Iban, living in longhouses mean that every family is subordinated to collective goals, which are encompassed by a larger totality from the longhouse family to the longhouse to the wider river region and beyond. And um, <clears throat> to illustrate how this idea of longhouse people having collective goals, and there is a larger group living in urban centers supporting those living in the longhouse of Long Pluan. They pool resources to support the continuity of the longhouse. So when one of two longhouses burnt down in 2018, rebuilding the longhouse was made possible through their efforts at fundraising. The longhouses endures over time because of the values of sociality and living in groups. The oral, oral narratives reinforce these ideals and play a role in holding the longhouse community together. So now I want to talk a bit about genre and we're going to look at definitions of oral history. Oral history developed from the need of to determine the history of peoples who had no documented history out of a demand to look at history from below. And I'm using a definition um, from Morrison, who talks about oral history being an account of a historical event, person or place, a first person narrative of, of the past by an eyewitness. There are two aspects relating to this definition of oral history. The first aspect is oral history derived from oral traditions that have been transmitted over generations. For example, the narratives of the Semai leaders paying tribute or, and being bestowed titles by sultans. The second aspect is from a personal account of an event in the past, 
So some people might be researching, for example, through oral history, the events of May the 10th, 1969. But we'll be looking at the first aspect of oral history being defined, derived from oral traditions. So I am grateful to Morrison who defines oral historical narratives as giving an account of events that occurred before the informant was born one or two or three or more generations ago. As James Scott notes, oral historical narratives are part of a wider repertoire of the oral traditions of a group and their function is to encompass ritual life, law and values that hold a community together. So I prefer to consider the Lompelwan oral historical narratives as stories of history rather than oral histories. In the Austronesian world, such oral narratives define origins. And although ideas of origins vary, the discourse on origins is characteristic Austronesian. And this encompasses a specific notion of the past. And to quote James Fox, that it is knowable and such knowledge is of, of value. And what happened in the past has set a pattern for the present. And it is essential to have access to the past in attempts to order the present. I'm now going to look at features of narratives and we're looking at genealogy and ancestry. Notions of ancestry are important to Austronesian discourse on origins. And the Longpulwan narratives are similar to narratives from the island of Roti. The true tale of Omao is situated in historical time which is generated through the genealogies of identifiable people. This makes a true tale different because it refers to specific persons, places and genealogical periods. It tells of the origin of a water source, establishing ownership rights to use. It is true because it is rooted in genealogical rather than mythical time. And therefore, um, Genealogies have a function as a means of recording and transmitting historical memory. So in this photograph, we can see the father of the narrator who's responsible for the transmission of the third narrative. And he himself was uh, a community leader over a wide area. And Melian Tapun recites a genealogy of leaders across seven generations. This establishes his authority as his narrator and validates his position as leader. And this is similar to narratives on the island of Roti, where a narrative is considered authentic if the narrator is the descendant of the ancestor whose deeds are narrated. So evoking names and establishing a personal connection with leading ancestors through descent is an expression of power. So we come now to the person persona of the narrator. In the top picture, we see a picture again of his father in the old long house. This photo was taken in 1983. And this is a picture of the man who followed him as leader. Um, and this man was the leader of Long Pluan for over 20 years and has the same name as the headman narrator who tells the narratives. But the headman narrator, although he took his name from this man, omits him from his list of leaders. So his list of the family of leaders is arbitrary and selective. And this shows us that the narrator's perspective is very local and often parochial. It's like other historical narratives in Borneo, related to the maintenance of power of the ruling families. And this factor is common to the genre of historical narratives at a universal level. To quote the famous oral, oral historian of Africa, Van Sina, the general history of the tribe is often identical with the history of the ruling house. However, there is still a relevance because narratives are relevant to a wider community. 
In the words of Ida Nicolaisen, whose narratives have served in court cases over the land rights of the Punamba, she states ethno-history serves as an important factor for the maintenance of ethnic identity. They evoke a wide network of kin who are validated by the reference to mutual ancestors, leading to the acknowledgement of active kinship relations. The long Puluan narratives demonstrate how a bigger grouping of people known as Luntao, it's a heterogeneous group, extends to Calabit, Kenya, Morek, and Saban allies and neighbors to kin on the Kryan River in Dutch Borneo. So the social audience of the audience is multiplied and extended to these places and in past time as heroes fight with allies in warfare and go to the fort at Marudi in the, in the Brook period and to Dutch Borneo to meet Christian missionaries. Another feature of historical oral narratives is place and memory. And a sense of place is recalled in the minds of the listeners as they remember ancestors who led migrations and to open new areas of land, becoming the first to fell forest and found a longhouse in a certain place. As pioneers make way for others to settle, their names are remembered by descendants claiming rights to use land through their ancestors. In the Long Paluan narratives, fruit trees are recalled in association with a paddy harvest. So inherited fruit trees are linked with the descendants of the first planter in the same way that fallow lands are linked with the descendants of the first people to open land up for Swidens. So James Fox talks about this reference to place as topo genie, and it's quite important because the recalling of names and places establishes the rootedness of historical narratives. Topo genie might recall the journey of an ancestor, a migration of a people, or the transmission of an object. Its key component is identified as a topoi, a physical point where culturally important knowledge is evoked. In the first Long Puluan narrative, a stone outcrop, Batu Long Lingak, is evoked. This stone outcrop is located on a footpath and recalls the separation of the Morek from the Calabit, as it is the place where two lovers, one Calabit and one Morek, committed suicide because the two communities did not agree on their staying together. This place has become a boundary marker and it is also evoked in songs. And here we've got an artist's impression of the Batu, of the lovers of Batu Longlingak to illustrate this part of the narrative. Another feature of Topogeni is what um, is called by James Fox, the spatialization of time. So people in the longhouse recall time in terms of the movement of longhouse locations. Don't worry about all these weird names. Each number represents a location of the longhouse since it got first established in about 1917. If people want to refer to an event happening at a certain time, for example, in 1957, they will say, they won't say that happened in 1957. They will say that happened when the longhouse were, was opposite Aurora Ring using, and we had billion shingles on the roof. Another example of topogeny is that it serves as a mnemonic device triggering memory for both the narrator and audience. It defines origins and claims to the earliest occupation of place. In the first Long Puluan narrative, megalith stone graves are marks on the landscape which provide a visible link with past generations and signify the earliest presence of the domain. So to quote the narrative, the narrator talks about the stone mounds and standing stones that they built along the river. So we've got um, slab graves here in this photo, 
that possibly go back, according to archaeologists, about 300 years. And this is a stone mound which was used to bury precious objects that belonged to um, families where there were no descendants to stop people from fighting over the inheritance. And some of these mounds go back over 3,000 years in the highlands. But there's much more to the story of these um, megalithic sites that I've written up in 2017. And if anyone's interested, they can get back to me about them. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit, I've talked about time being um, talked about in terms of longhouse locations. I'm going to talk about another way time is considered. Um, Maxwell, and this is Alan Maxwell, who's written about Malay uh, and Brunei narratives and Badang narratives. He talks about the way people conceptualize the path through ethno-historical texts contain, contain a system of traditional values, which are often expressed in conceptualizations, which the group has about its own past. Thus, a historical narrative works at the first level, the narration tells of origins, migrations, and events in the history of the group, and secondly, and outlines their conceptualizations of the past. In the Longpoluan narratives, events are remembered in an episodic manner. For example, the first narrative is about our time with the Morek and warfare, the second is about the life of government, and the third narrative is about the life of prayer reflecting three eras of change. And there's another example for the Iban who describe warfare as Musim Kayao, and they talk about a time of upheaval as Musim Kachao. And the purpose of such narratives is not sequential history, but what makes sense morally and culturally. And this is relayed in the form of episodes. We'll come back to this point later on in this talk. But to return to Maxwell's point at the beginning of the section, the conceptualization of the past comes through moral and cultural filters, which are influenced through the value system. Another way that the value system is apparent is through the voice of the narrator, who has a purpose for reciting the narratives and who creates and expresses meaning. In the long one narrative, such meanings are relevant in the present and become expressed through the narrator as he addresses the Longhouse audience with comments which relate to his problems with the community in the present. So, for example, I'll, the first example, um, he says, talking about a, a situation where people had to give a lot of hospitality, the villagers not, did not question this because the elders asked them to do this. So this is loaded with a meaning for his audience. And then I'll just go to the third example. He's, he asks the community not to quarrel. Let us not quarrel and create discord. And this is, you can see, this is a troubled narrator having to cope with a lot of conflict in the community. But he's urging people to come together because if there is no consensus, the longhouse will break up and people will become scattered. So how do we interpret such meanings, the meanings of the narrator, the value system? The, narrate, the narratives themselves lend themselves to what Clifford Gertz calls thick description. That is sufficiently deep and textured accounts that lend themselves to an interpretive approach. He cautions against the use of theoretical tools and he sees the task for the anthropologist to uncover the underlying cultural beliefs that motivate and characterize his, his subject's behavior. Theory should emerge from thick description rather than imposed upon it. This leads to an analysis of the way underlying values and the value system which prevail in the community have impacts on the way the story is told. And Maxwell comes up with a wonderful quotation. <clears throat> he says, in order to understand the thinking of a people in contemporary times, knowledge of their traditional values as expressed in their thinking about the past can be crucial to any understanding of how they interpret what is happening in the modern world. 
This is close to Goetz's notion of using a system of analysis be that belongs to the people being studied. A study of the notion of traditional values addresses what inspires the narrator's political intentions in recounting the narratives and provides insights into strategies for augmenting status and power. This enables a reading of the narratives, not objectively, but in terms of the subjectivity of the narrator and the concerns of his audience. Seen in this matter, what some scholars identify as falsifications and lapses of memory or gaps in accuracies by the narrator are not to be dismissed as ahistorical blunders, but are utilized as a strategy for gaining insights into the purpose of the narratives by the narrator. So in my book, the next section addresses the bigger issue of defining value as a theoretical framework and provides insight into Calabic concepts of traditional values. And this provides a tool for analyzing the meaning of long Luan narratives through the perspective of the narrator of, and his audience. And this is really the subject for another talk, if we want. To sum up so far, um, I know we've covered a lot of ground. Um, the long Luan oral historical narratives are oral traditions that share features in common with Austronesian narratives. The selective use of genealogies to evoke powerful ancestors, topogeny for organizing memory and making claims on the domain, the conceptualization of time in episodic terms. This conveys a moral and cultural framework for viewing the past through the voice of the narrator, which reflects his value system and that of his audience. Now, I am not going to talk about value as an analytical tool, um, which acts as, which underscores the action of heroes and promotes the sociality which keeps the longhouse together. I'm now going to go in on to the nitty gritty of, of dealing with method and oral historical narratives. Uh, to say a little bit more about an anthropological approach, knowledge of language and culture is essential to approaching meaning. And the anthropologist's task is to use cross-references from field work within the community and clarify cultural associations to elucidate the full communicative structure of the text. Questions need to be raised regarding reasons for transmission, sources and meaning of language. The scope of anthropology accepts the subjective relevant and meaning interpretations of oral history and fieldwork gets its truths partial and varied as they may be. It enables history to move into a new direction, allowing for multiple viewpoints. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute. So an anthropological approach to oral history provides an opportunity to look at history as it is shaped by values and culture through an ethnographic perspective. I'm going to show you a problem I had with multiple viewpoints. So I have this wonderful ancestor hero in the second narrative called Tai Wan. He is the hero of the second narrative and he's declared the first Pengulu of the Calabit. And this is endorsed by other scholars. And however, I find that he's completely sidelined in two other narratives of Calabit history. His contemporary Tingan is made out to be the first Pingulu and led the attack on Paiban. Tingan opens a new route out of the highlands and also leads the making of the fort at Liamatu. These are all achievements which Milian Tapun, the narrator, attributes to Taiwan. Further to this, it is stated by Tala that Taiwan couldn't get people's support. He was only a temporary leader because there was no one suitable or capable enough. So how to deal with this anomaly? I have, have to remember that the memory of the narrator is shaped by his immediate community around him. And his voice is one of many potential voices regarding the subjects he raises. So I found by looking at Bert and Quiola, who look at a Solomon Islands Chronicle, they advocate the importance of presenting a narrative together with alternative views. 
And so you need to document the perspectives of the narrator and the points of view of other communities and put these side by side. Um, Two I Smith talks about the way indigenous communities live with different and conflicting narratives relating to land and resources as indigenous ways of knowing. And in my experience of field work, I found these multiple viewpoints coming up time and again as I compared my narrator's oral histories with, for example, our, our Penan neighbors. And I talk about this in our book. I'm going to talk about another way we have conflict, uh, anomalies, um, and these are historical anomalies. So on one side, I'm going to share with you events in the narrative, and on the other side are events in recorded history, according to the Sarawak Gazette. So in the narrative, Taiwan visits the Brunei Penguran, who gives him the flag. The fort, the fort at Marudi was made at thatch and flattened bamboo at this time. And the narrative suggests that the attack against Pai Bang took place during the rule of the Brunei government. But in recorded history, in 1882, Barams was ceded to the Brook government and Brunei no longer ruled the Baram. There was a temporary fort built at Marudi in the Brook period. And in 1905, the attack on Pai Ban was supported by representatives of the Brook government in Marudi. So how do I deal with these anomalies? The narrative doesn't match with recorded history. The only thing that matches is a recollection of the fort. However, when I look further back, the temporary fort built at Marudi, we have no other records of a fort being built prior to the Brook period. This, this although we don't, we're not sure. So the narrator sets most of the action in the time of the Brunei government, which conflicts with the official chronology. That is the attack on Pai Bang took place during the Brook era, not the Brunei era. The narrator has a different concept of what took place in the Brunei area to what has been officially recorded. But we should not examine the narrative in a linear sequential notion of time, because this isn't the way local people look at time. Time needs to be looked at in, to, in terms of a point of view, a perception of the past. We need to suspend Western ideas of narrative realism and notions of linear history. Time, as we have seen, was conceived by the Canabit, not in sequential line of the dates of the calendar, but more in terms of places, old longhouses, trees on the landscape, places families farm, times of good or bad harvest, or incidents such as epidemics and the eruption of Krakatoa. In the remote highlands, the transition between regimes was gradual and the Calabit were oblivious to the change of Brook rule as the Brunei Malays continued to serve as intermediaries upriver for the Brook regime as they dealt with, the, with trade in prestige items. To take this argument further, it's important to look at events from a spatial rather than a temporal perspective. So the Brunei Penguran can be seen at the center and action takes place in a number of widening circles rather than a temporal sequence. This provides a metaphor for the long life of Taiwan and his prestige as leader. And this moment with the Penguran at Fort is a symbolic moment and links, links Taiwan with the intangible potency of Brunei power and the literate culture of the Brunei Malays. Um, another thing that is important to look at with your method is the chain of transmission. And Van Sina talks about the train of transmission and layers of time, which Hong talks about. So the first layer of time is the initial testimony and the first observer witnesses the event. Then there's the hearsay account. In the first narrative, it's Melian's source, an auntie called Balubun Kalang, with whom Melian stayed as a boy in Long Simiang. 
The next layer of time is Melian's narration of the story in 2006 into a cassette tape. And at this point, we can see how Melian locates himself in the narrative. And I won't talk about his comments on what he says is important, but I can demonstrate that his narration has an objective of affirming wider kinship and asserting the earlier occupation of territory um, by mentioning the megalithic stone. The next layer of time is the listening of the tape in Calabit by his audience, and they filter the narrative. And the final layer is this process of translation and transcription by the researcher who's using the filters of her method. I just finally want to say something about transcribing and translating because I made a few mistakes. I first listened to the cassette tapes in the longhouse and I got a translation of the outline in English. Then I came back to Kuching and I listened again and I revised the translation making the English sound much more fluent and more interesting. Then I started my PhD and realized that we'd missed transcription into Calabit and that I'd been wrong to enhance the literal translation. And there are always things that stop you transcribing. People have different spelling systems. People come along and want to change the spelling. But we decided to stick to a spelling system that my husband was used to and was still used by the church. And we made sure it was consistent as we went along. And it's important as you translate from your transcription to leave gaps unanswered rather than being creative because you might distort the original meaning. So other considerations to think about for method. I talked about the narrator being on the borders. I talked about marginality and I talked about distance from centers. I talked about fieldwork methods. I talk about my position as a researcher, the wife of a Calabit, <clears throat> a woman, a Christian, a person who's got relatives in the longhouse. I talked about being an outsider and an insider. I talked about ethical considerations and multi-sided fieldwork. So to sum up, I've set the background of the Austronesian legacy of longhouse societies and their narratives for establishing the genre of long one historical narratives, which come from a Calabit longhouse and the longhouse is important because it means much more than just a place where people dwell. It's a place which a lot of the community identify with, even though they don't live there. I describe oral history and oral traditions as a means of defining genre. I talked about true tales. I talked about features of genre. I talked about the moral framework. I talked about an anthropological approach using thick description. I talked about techniques for analyzing the narratives. And finally, I just want to say that the narratives bring people together in mixed social kinship groups and reinforce the longhouse values of sociality. Thank you. Um, anyone wants any references, please get in touch. And this is my contact or contact me through Pusat Sajara Rakyat. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie. That was great. Um, that was a lot of information. A few people asked me in the text personally um, if this will, recording will be made available. I just want to let people know that uh, we will put up the recording uh, on the PSR website and you, you can look for other uh, webinars there too because it's so rich I think if people want to sort of look at it again uh, as I, I do as well. Um, I think Diana has a lot to say <laughs> now after that great presentation so um, let me uh, invite Diana here into the room. Uh, you just have to unmute yourself. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Valerie, for transporting us to that Calabit longhouse uh, landscape in mountainous Borneo, where we've been stuck because of the MCO. 
uh, in KL for the past nine months. It was a real treat. Now, I'm not an anthropologist, so I won't be able to do full justice to your presentation. My comments, uh, in my comments, I'll try to link some of the things you have said today to the other themes uh, in the previous uh, presentations and to the main theme of our of the PSR web of this PSR uh, webinar series, which is the theme of people's history of Sajara Rakyat, not just official history, and the question of how to write an inclusive history of the nation, mm. of this country, mm. of a very pluralistic society. And I think in that respect, Valerie, this presentation is extremely important mm. because she reminds us uh, that there is a part of the country that is outside Kuala Lumpur, outside of Samananjo, and a kind of society that is outside of uh, urban, uh, Valerie just uh, gave me her, her sympathies for having to live in Kuala Lumpur. There is another way of living uh, uh, outside of Semenanjung and outside of our urban centers. Um, that history, that part of the country belongs to the nation as well. I think we need to be reminded of that, unfortunately. And that history is part of the history of our nation. Now, how do we deal with that history? Mm -hmm. The first lesson I think I learned from Valerie's presentation tonight was how important history itself is mm -hmm. to collaborate society. You know, we used to be taught, at least uh, in first, first year anthropology, there are supposed to be these primitive tribal societies, people without a history. But I think Valerie's presentation, which has focused on the historical narratives, the ch uh, Charita Sajara of this society shows how important history itself is to them. Now, those were the preliminary remarks. Um, I will do two things in my commentary. I will give a very brief uh, summary of, of, of what Valerie just had to say, and it's not going to be easy because she said a lot. And then I will raise a few comments and questions regarding the two main themes that she has spoken to today, that of genre and that of method, with regard to these Charita Sajara that she presented to us. Uh, these were stories that she came across by, which fell into her lap by serendipity, uh, as she says, oral traditions passed on from generation to generation. And she looks at these perspectives, these stories from, uh, at these narrati uh, uh, narratives from two perspectives, as genre, as method, as genre and as method. Now as genre, um, she identifies, I think basically three features of uh, these stories as genre, as a particular type. The first is that of genealogy. And that's important because genealogy is used to evoke powerful ancestors. And genealogy, you must remember, is actually uh, uh, based on the concept of linear time. Mm. Then there is, how do you pronounce that word, topogeny? Yeah, topogeny, uh, yeah. Well, basically, I understand it as a process of placemaking. Mm. So whereas genealogy is about time making, but in terms of establishing your, 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 your lineage, in terms of establishing generational time, which is linear time, mm. topogeny is, that, is, is a process of placemaking that's a very important feature mm. of these stories and the meaning of these stories. And the, thir the third, well, as she says, topogeny is about place names mm -hmm. to organize memory and to make claims on the domain, on the territory. Mm. The third feature is that of time making again, place making, time making, but time making not in terms of a genealogy but time making in episodic terms, key collective events, which are important to the, again, to, 
to the meaning of the story, of these stories. And she, 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 she says, and I quote her actually, these stories, these, these features of, of the Charita uh, uh, Sajara, of these oral uh, traditions, provide a moral and cultural framework for viewing the past through the voice of the narrator. And this is an important point, which reflects his value system, the value system of the narrator, but also that of his audience. It's a collective story. It's a shared story. It reflects the value system of the narrator, but can only work because it also reflects the value system of his audience. I, at least that's the way I understood value. So that's basically, I think, my summary of what you were saying about Charita Sajara, about oral tradition as genre. Now to method. She talks a lot about method as well, but I won't be able to give a full record of what she said. Uh, I'll pick up two points uh, in terms of method in the anthropological approach to such a uh, text. I think the first point she makes, and that's why she says language and you know, knowing the language, knowing the culture, knowing the people is important. What is important is to add context to text. You have the text, your historical narratives, an, anthropo an anthropological approach as method would also emphasize not just the, 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 the text in itself on its own, but you an anthropological approach as method would emphasize the importance of adding context to text. Um, I think the point you made about uh, anomalies is very important, but it's a bit, I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. The, the second point I want to uh, 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 draw out from her, her uh, on, on the, on, from what she says about uh, method is the process of transmission and the question of transcription. That's more a technical issue. Uh, how important it is to, to uh, do transcriptions in the right way. She says she did it in the wrong way. Um, I think basically the question there, both in terms of context as well as in terms of transmission is the question of interpretation. How do you interpret uh, as method text, linguistic text? Mm. Okay, to the first point on genre. Actually, well, um, if we also think back to the other presentations that we've had, Valerie makes this distinction as well between oral traditions, which is the kind of stories that she's been telling, she, she told us about today, and oral history interviews, for example, think back to Paul, uh, Dr. Paul's uh, uh, presentation on interviews, on, on stories, individual stories that she collected about May 13th. Mm. There are two different types, Valerie says, of oral histories. Oral traditions are collective, oral history interviews are individual, oral traditions are transmitted over generations, uh, oral history interviews are just the expression of a particular uh, uh, memory at a particular point in time of a particular individual. It struck me actually that the oral tradition that Valerie told us uh, about today are uh, maybe not so unfamiliar to us. They're like uh, what we have termed in earlier discussions in the series, official history, the history of a ruling lineage, mm. the history of a ruling class. Yeah. 
Yeah. Official history. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And the point is, and I think you pointed out in your anomalies as well, this official history, these collective oral traditions, they are, despite claiming to speak for the people, for the community, for the Ratya, official histories like your oral traditions are partial, based, mm -hmm. are partial, they're selective, they are parochial. But they, they make a claim mm -hmm. to universality. Mm -hmm. Therein lies the power. Mm. At the same time, if you look at, oh uh, yeah, uh, your the context in which you place these uh, this text, what you show is how important this type of narrative, this this uh, collective tradition, uh, collective tradition, this official history, how important this type of narrative is by drawing on the collective memory of ancestors, of place, of time, place-making, topogeny, time-making, genealogy, by drawing upon these features, these tricks in the narratives, these features of the narrative, this type of narrative enables, constitutes moral values and a moral community. Mm. Moral values and a moral community are constituted by this kind of collective tradition. Mm. We can call it official history. Mm. Societies do need shared his stories. They do need collective memory. They do need an official history. It seems to me, listening to you, if we think about the collaborative experience. Mm. On the other hand, however, if you look at the other type, type, your type two stories, your type two oral history, the individual narratives, it's a mistake to think that they are purely individual. They are never purely individual. Mm. I think that was the point, that was what we learned from Maurice Hubbard. I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm only called sociologist. So Maurice Habvax was the French sociologist whose writings on memory actually initiated so-called memory studies that we have been uh, reading about. Habvax's main point, main argument, uh, was that there is a social framework of memory. That's the title of his book, Social Frameworks of Memory that individual remembering is always, even if unconsciously or subconsciously, individual remembering the stories we tell at any particular time when we remember something is always framed by collective memory. The shared framework of the social milieu into which we are born and raised. So remember the discussion at Dr. Poor's uh, talk about whether individual stories are representative or not. And she said, oh, well, why should they be in representative? Well, they may not be representative. Individual stories, individual narratives may not be representative in a way that Oral traditions, like the one by, that you just presented to us, claim to be representative, claim to be universal. Individual uh, stories may not be representative, but they are never entirely isolated and subjective either. They are framed by collective memory. They are not entirely isolated and subjective like that of a hermit crab. We live in a social milieu. We're born into a social milieu. We are raised in that social milieu. We do not think like a hermit crab. Okay, so my point is both official narratives, official history, 
as well as individual narratives. Mm. Official narratives are collective, but invariably partial. While individual narratives are always partial, but also invariably collective. So it seems to me the problem is the suppression in both cases that comes through partiality. And the suppression of memories, maybe through th trauma, for example. The suppression of milieus, that's what happened and what happens in official uh, history. The collabit milieu would not be taken into account in the official history of Malaysia, maybe. So the suppression of memories, suppression of milieus, especially of marginal milieus. Now, I want to suggest that rather than looking at these two types of oral histories as categorially distinct entities, we should see them methodologically as existing in a dialectical relationship to one another. The methodology of a history from below should do precisely this, namely allow for a free flow of exchange between collective traditions, aka official history, and alternative histories, mm. individual histories, mm. people's histories, a free flow of exchange, of debate between these two types, thereby allowing for, I said, a dialectical relationship, whatever that means. And it should, this kind of debate, this kind of exchange should allow space for revision, mutual revision for enrichment, mutual enrichment. And maybe, and that's one topic that we haven't touched on at all actually in our previous uh, uh, presentations so far, the question of forgetting. The question of? Forgetting, not just remembering, mm -hmm. but forgetting. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go into that much later. I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time. Okay, so that was my comment on, 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 on genre. Uh, not really a question, but comments, and I would have appreciate what Valerie would have to say to these comments. To method, let me make that very quick. Uh, Valerie, you have uh, highlighted the importance of narration and transcription. That is, again, generating textual material. Now, I love having a transcript because it means I can spend hours poring over a text to tease out the meaning. But anthropological method, uh, the anthropological, when I started doing field work that was many, many decades ago, we did have a recorder, a tape recorder. Uh, when we went into a village to do research or into a longhouse. And I remember when I went into, uh, I, I did my research in, in a Malay village in, in Kedah in the late 1970s, I used to get very frustrated because whenever there was a kunduri, the men would all sit in the living room and eat together and discuss politics, which I was keep, you know, dying to hear about. And I would have to sit in the kitchen with the women. Yeah. But, yeah. but then I realized in the kitchen, the women were talking about, for example, how much debt their men were in how much money they owed, which the men never talked about. The export of the brain power technology to China, the very Sorry, I'm afraid I didn't hear that. Okay, anyway, let me just finish very quickly. Now, um, they would never have spoken like that if I had had a recorder and was about to make a transcription. Mm. So I would make a distinction between narrative and conversation in anthropological method. 
And I would suggest that by focusing overwhelmingly, I think the trend we have been the, the trend has been there on narrative and the generation of textual material through transcriptions. Mm. We're losing out on the context that my uh, context type knowledge that we can get through conversations. These conversations are also, they also occur uh, through serendipity. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I was, that would be a question I would raise with you, whether uh, we would not be losing out actually through a uh, focus just on textual material and on narratives. Mm. That's all, thank you. Sorry I took so long. Thank you, uh, thank you, Diana. Um, uh, before I, I read one of the questions, um, Valerie, would you like to respond to any of the uh, comment or sort of question raised by Diana first? Um, what she said, I mean, it's obviously, when I'm looking and talking about the meaning, what she's talking about the, the movement from narrative on a recording. Now I have to emphasize that the narrator gave these to me as recordings. So I first heard them as recordings. For me to make sense of them, I made them into texts. And when I went forwards to really understand them, I perhaps will touch on conversations that I've had with the narrator and with other people to cross-reference what is said to tease out meaning. And I could talk more about this um, when I'm looking at meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you saw the megaliths, so I had a converse, we went to go and look at some megaliths, and another person in the village took us to see the megaliths, and there was another story, which the Kenya have about a megalith and a crocodile, and that led to a completely different diversion away from the stories, which I then wrote up as a paper. I talk about that as a moment of serendipity. And it also showed another dimension on the claim of the domain that other people had stories about those megaliths and they were linked to a, a, a myth about a crocodile. I've written about this in a volume that came out in 2017. Thank you, thank you, Valerie. Maybe I'll go move to the uh, a question and then uh, we can back. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, for your intervention, uh, which brought a lot of um, great points to think about. And I, I can see that, you know, something that can't just be responded immediately also because there's so many uh, things to consider and, and sort of think about. Um, Valerie, your presentation really brought me to, um, the, I mean, for me, I've, not, I've actually not been to the Club at Highlands, but um, to uh, on the other side in Long Pasia, just sort of oh. like the other side. So there's a lot of very similar kind of stories with crocodiles and megaliths. So it's, I've been enjoying thinking about the, some of the stories I've heard over there and, and sort of comparing it to um, your presentation. Uh, let me go to a question by Quinny. Uh, thank you, Valerie, for the presentation. I was wondering if there are any published documents or exhibitions or websites or books uh, etc of the oral narratives that are gathered or are there any future plans to turn them into something tangible? Um, so um, I've made three video recordings um, of the narrator telling the stories again and I'm thinking of doing something with these recordings but I haven't been and I've actually written a screenplay for a documentary but um, I'm looking for people to collaborate on that. Um, I've written 
two articles, and I've published two articles uh, on the, the oral narratives to date, uh, which you can find in my, you can go to Academia EDU and you will find my materials and, and contacts. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I, I, li I like to ask you a bit, uh, uh, you know, sort of your personality, you were saying, um, you know, your entry point was um, being married into the community. Are there some stories that they would rather, that the community would rather not have documented or are there any stories that are just, I, we're just telling you the story, uh, the story shouldn't come out from the community. Are there certain types of, uh, you know, rules or taboos around, around oral stories? I think uh, some, some community leaders don't like people to talk about the era of headhunting and their spiritual beliefs at that time because they've all become evangelical Christian and they have broken with that aspect of their past. So it's not always easy to get stories about what happened before they became Christian. So that, you know, it really depends on who you talk to and you're lucky if somebody wants to share and there's anyone who still remembers that time now. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's I remember that also being in Long Pasia because or there were different retellings of the time uh, um, in making the stories more in jive with uh, the new religion, like, um, uh, you know, stories that the spirits would sort of change from, 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 from perhaps uh, a, from ancestors to one that's more, um, uh, in, you know, so in line with the idea of Christianity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of interesting to look at, a diff, you know, uh, the story of the same, um, the same story, but, but with different meanings uh, attributed to, to them. Um, there's a question by Chong Li Yo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Larry, for your sharing. Do you mind sharing your thoughts? If um, the way Kalabit uh, ways of thinking about their past time or space poses any differences with other indigenous people in Sarawak, particularly those living ne uh, live near to them in Long Paluan? Okay, there are issues over land. Um, so their immediate neighbors are a Penan. The narrative that the Canabit say is that the Canabit were in the area first and were farming the area first. And they point to the megaliths now as evidence of their ancestral claim to the land. And they say they evangelized to the Panan who were wondering, and eventually the Panan came and settled on what the Calabit say was Calabit land. However, the Panan, some of the Panan elders say, yes, it was Calabit land, but a lot of the younger people don't recognize this. So you've got conflicting narratives about the land from the Panan and from the Kanabit. A further complication is that when I first went to the Highlands, to this part of the Highlands, in the 1980s, people said that the stone culture was made by the Morek, who were in the area, uh, maybe in the <clears throat> early 1800s, and our people lived together with the Ngorek and it was the Ngorek that built the stone culture. That was what was said in the 1980s. But now because there's been a lot of emphasis on the megalithic culture in other parts of the highlands and they're being identified with the Calabit by archeologists in other parts of the highlands, the Calabit here now say, this is part of our ancestral past. So they don't talk about the Morag. It's quite complicated. And I've written about this in this 2017 article, but there are all these different layers going on about different
different perceptions of land and the domain which have come about. That's very interesting and, and, and thank you for that question. Sort of, so the, how, how would then sort of um, your writing about the Morag, um, is, it, is this a, 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 also an Orang Ulu? It's an Orang Ulu group, yeah. That were sort of settled there earlier or? Sorry? That well, they were settled there and they moved further away or? or yes, yeah, they, they separated. Oh. But in fact, what was very interesting is the, the people of Long Paluan have Morek ancestry. And so the genealogies are of the Morek and the Calabit are intertwined. And even Calabit further away have Morek in their genealogies. I mean, basically, there isn't such a thing necessarily as a pure Calabit, you mm -hmm. know, and our... But what, what comes out of the narrative, particularly the first narrative, is how heterogeneous people are. And this was backed up with a lot of work that I did on genealogies and family trees. And this idea of our people, of this common ancestry with a very wide group of people, and this term, our people, keeps coming up in the narratives. And it shows how we, how, the Calabit in Long Paluan have this idea of a much wider and inclusive social identity. And of course, this changed with the Brooks and people being identified in the colonial period in terms of ethnic labels. And so I talk about the contrast and the narrator starts to use the ethnic label when he wants to make claims on land. And so his ethnic identity as Calabit is very clearly there when he says, oh, it was the Calabit that made these um, stone graves. Mm. So, I should, so that's interesting, like how then, uh, what is the role of academics in this position when mm. you are sort of presenting a story um, which may contradict some claims that they're trying to make now um, so, I mean, so what is the role of the academic in, 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 in this position, do you think? I had to, I, I had, it was quite tricky because when I'm asking questions in the village, mm -hmm. I have this very strong loyalty to the narrator who gave me these stories. I have to move around and I cross check and I have to explain that as I see it, there can be lots of versions of the same story. And because people are, are very strong Christians, I can say, well, it's like different versions of uh, the nativity story of Jesus Christ. And they, they can see that because it, it fits in with their biblical knowledge. But then when I've got conflicting narratives, I, I, I have a duty to and in my book, I talk about different narratives existing side by side. Um, but also in my book, I've stated my position that I cannot cause, I don't want to be uh, a person who's going to start conflict in the village. I've got loyalties to certain people and I just make that position very clear. So I don't want to cause discord, I don't want to cause conflict. I do state that other groups have got other versions of stories about this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's something that I also, um, you know, think about a lot as, as, uh, as um, indigenous groups are going to court and so the nature of the court judicial system, it, it, it sort of locks you in certain kinds of narratives as well, right? That ones that are uh, where people have to box and label themselves and present themselves in certain ways. And um, like having multiplicity of, uh, uh, of different uh, histories sort of, sort of clashes with that kind of like one narrative. Yeah, so it's something definitely uh, to consider. I do, uh, Diana, do you have anything to sort of add to that? Yeah. But I, I, well, I think generally the 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 uh, issue that Valerie and you have brought up uh, here, Valerie in particular, is mm. that of 
the role of ethics in anthropological method as well. Mm. It's something we haven't been able to really touch upon much, uh, but it has cropped up again and again, like in, in previous uh, discussions as well. And maybe we ought to take one whole session to talk specifically about the question of ethics when, that, when there are uh, conflicting stories, conflicting, uh, and, and one has loyalties, for example, mm -hmm. or the question of trauma and uh, how should one behave as a researcher uh, mm -hmm. when somebody tells a story that, when, when we seemingly want to dig out a traumatic past. So I think there are really common themes which, which have run through even the five uh, web uh, seminars that we've had that may be worth pursuing. Hmm. Yeah, Hyung Kong here says, thanks Valerie for a wonderfully thick and rich presentation. And thanks Diana for linking tonight's talk to earlier PSR conversations and many provocative comments. So um, that's from Hyung Kong. I don't know if you have any questions, Hyung Kong. Uh, I wanted to go back to um, what Diana said about forgetting. You kind of, you said something about it, but didn't quite elaborate uh, on it. I, I wonder if you, you'd like to to, to say something about, um, about that, like the idea of forgetting as part of remembering as well. Not the right person, but briefly, I, I think um, Valerie talked about partial memories, parochial memories, different memories. Some of it, and, and, and that raises the question for Valerie as well as to the value of such narratives for history when they conflict with each other and when they are conflict with official chronological history as we, as, as, as we know it. Uh, but uh, sometimes it is deliberate falsification, but in, in crafting, maybe in overcoming trauma at the personal level, you have to be able to forget, to heal. Uh, at the collective level, it may be necessary to forget collect, at, collectively, deliberately. Um, maybe after a process of reconciliation, mm. but forgetting is probably very much, is constitutive or constitutive. You're an English teacher, I have to be careful about the way I speak. <laughs> it is constitutive of uh, uh, the process of, 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 of uh, remembering, of constructive remembering. Again, it's not something I, I really have thought very much about, but I think, again, it's something that we may have to, we may have to think about rather than, 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 than laboring labeling everything that is anomalous, that, uh, uh, it's a term, that's a term that, that Valerie used, everything that is anomalous as, as, as irregular or wrong mm -hmm. in our search for meaning. Mm -hmm. Valerie, you wanted to add to that? Well, um, I've been thinking about dilemmas so I've been, I, I worked for a while in the Sarawak Museum and I had a very interesting time because I found objects that had been looted in warfare. And these objects were set, a, a deliberate set, it said in the registration book that they were looted in warfare in the curator's hand. And I was able to find the, I could, with a lot of, um, detective work, I was able to work out possibly when they were taken, when they were collected. And they were all objects relating to women. And they were hats that are used to protect children. They were tripods that you use in a hearth. And they were domestic wooden utensils. And when I actually found the community that was possibly related to these objects, they had no idea of the expedition that had been, they had, the community themselves 
had no knowledge of these objects or the punitive expedition. And it was almost like, here I am with these objects and these were looted. And imagine they came from women. Goodness knows what must have happened. And they just looked at me as if I was weird. I mean, they're also evangelical Christians and they've broken with their past. And yet, if I look even further, there were members of another ethnic group. So these people were Kenya Badang. And the, the E-band had sided with the Brooks and participated. So it also was evoking a lot of conflict between Kenya Badang and E-band. And here was I, the researcher, was evoking this awful warfare and these objects and what does all this mean now? I mean, it gives a, a really interesting story in the museum. And I'm not quite sure how the community that's connected with them really wants to see these. And what about reviving the stories of animosity and warfare between the Iban and the Badan? And this is what I'm doing as a historian or as an anthropologist. It's a bit scary and I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here with all this. Do people want to have that retelling or they would rather not have that moment? Well, I came across some reluctance to begin with, but it will be interesting to see once the museum is open and these objects are actually going to be displayed, what people think. But it made me think about another genre, which is creative non-fiction and how you could write, you know, if, if I was creative enough to actually recreate the scene of a battle and the taking of the objects and them coming to, from the point of view of creative nonfiction, it might be another way in. I'm, I'm getting quite excited because there are quite a lot of historical um, dramas that one sees in the tele on television set in, I know, Mary Queen of Scots or stuff like that. Mm. And it's made me think a lot more about other ways of creating history in Malaysia through creative nonfiction. I mean, now everyone's getting very keen on video and animation and stuff like that. But it's still a problem, the stories, when you've got stories of conflict and warfare and headhunting, and whether these stories because no one's ever really talked about reconciliation, how, what we do with stories that revive conflicts or even open old wounds. It might even happen in a school playground or on a school football field. And you don't know what the consequences might be. Mm. Yeah, I guess on the other hand, it might be those wounds are still there and that it, it might be an opportunity for healing as well uh, in being able to, um, you know, talk. I think this is what some of the people who have been working on sort of, um, you know, creating more space for stories about me to themes and, you know, sort of very, not, very aware and acknowledging the fact that it's a very painful period, but um, the fact that the wound is still there and unless we, um, you know, sort of, do something and, 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 and confront it. And but you know, there's a, a big debate whether do we want to do it? Does it open up more wounds? Would it make it worse? Um, so I guess the same, the same question that you're asking, um, it might be the, you know, the wound is there, but uh, it's, it, 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 you might not need to have that process of sort of thinking through, um, you know, what really happened and, and how were they able to get to this point where you are um, in a you know, sort of condition of peace among the different groups? Well, maybe we need to remember in order to be able to forget. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's something that a lot of people have been talking about. Yeah. Um, um, let me let me just uh, also just um, invite people to ask more questions, uh, if you like. I also wanted to um, sort of uh, think about um, some of the things that uh, was brought up earlier about, um, I, I guess I've been reading a lot about how 
uh, indigenous identity is very relational and dynamic. And you kind of uh, show this through um, sort of the history uh, and the stories and sort of how people relate to them differently at different times. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about this sort of thinking. Do you think Kalabit, like the Kalabit stories are also um, quite relational in that it, it is this a story about um, what Kalabit is not, like they're not Penan, they're not Punan, they're not Iban, they're not Bidayo. Um, do you think the stories are also told to also, um, you know, so these identities are always relational, that is always um, to be able to distinguish oneself from other groups. And also now with sort of the global indigenous identity, and I know some, uh, you know, groups in, in, in Strava also, uh, actively engage and involve in sort of the global discourse of indigenous rights language. So there's another form of identity there as well that one relates to. So do, do you see that also with people in the Kalabit Highlands with the stories that they tell? Um, you know, for example, um, just to give you an example, some of the communities that I, I work in, in Guamusang, um, talk about like climate change. They, they, I mean, of course, they've always told these stories about flooding and, uh, you know, what happens if you don't take care of the forest, but they're also beginning to use the language of climate change to be able to talk about some of these stories to, to be able to, to, for, to relate to a bigger audience, right, to a global audience. They've been talking about floods and, you know, uh, you know what happens if you cut down the forest, but now they're linking it to sort of like global language. So I wanted to ask if you see that as well, uh, with people, uh, in, you know, the stories that you hear in, in, in the, from the Calabit Islands? Um, I think we've, I think you get recurrence of flood stories, particularly mm -hmm. because people are experiencing that, but they probably, there's more linking with biblical flood stories um, than anything that's coming up. Um, about identities, I would say that in these three narratives, for the most part, we're getting more heterogeneous identities of identities with allies, because we're a very small longhouse on the edge of the highlands, and the narrator wants to make bigger groups. So he's calling on allies as he, as he talks his narratives. And in the last narrative, which is perhaps a bit more Calabit, it's still talking about the Panan and how they evangelize and they become a bigger Christian group. So there's always this idea about making groups bigger. Of course, there are also stories about migrations and you get separations with migrations. And so at one point, the Calabit go into the highlands and the Moret go down river because the Calabit bit are good at walking and they're not very good with boats uh, and so you do get one or two glimpses of Calabit identity coming up as being the ones who, who go walking or the um the ones who've got who, who are connected with the stone culture and and that's because they're wanting to protect their domain there Thank you, thank you, Valerie. And in terms of the so the global indigenous identity, are there any? Uh... I, I I don't know. For me, I would see that more. Um, I I'd, I'd say that's more with educated urban Calabit than rural Calabit, and I think that's being done by Calabit intellectuals, shall we say. Um, and activists. Mm -mm. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, let, um, if there's any other questions, please do uh, write in. Um, Diana, if you wanted to bring up any of the earlier points that you brought up. No, I'm fine. <laughs> okay, and or Valerie, if you have any um, comments that you'd like to respond to, uh, early, to some of the things that was brought up by by Diana. No, I mean, I, I really enjoyed your comments, Diana, and I really um, feel very strongly about the need to um, have a more inclusive history of Malaysia. I, I, I see that 
as, as very important. And there are people rewriting a history syllabus. I think we need to get in as much as we can from the edges of, of the nation. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. Um, I also think that official history is also very partial and selective. And I think, you know, we might have, I've got a selection of dates at the back of the Sarawak Almanac, and that's a chronology of events as recorded by Brooke administrators, by um, colonial administrators, and then by the Malaysian state. And those are all the important events according to the chroniclers of the state. But of course, it doesn't have events that might be people important to people upriver. For example, when the fort was made, or the fort might be in, when the fort was made, or when they became Christian as important dates for them. Yes. And of course, what you brought also, I mean, we've been, um, one of the things, I mean, we, in Pusat Siara, yet also we're very aware that um, a lot of our conversations have revolved on um, about history in, in Peninsula Malaysia, right, which is sort of the dominant narrative um, and, and less, less of uh, uh, Sabah and Sarawak and definitely less of sort of the um, sort of the, you know, the indigenous communities and minority groups in, in, in those places as well. So I think you, you sort of, you know, your, your, your intervention is, is really appreciated in sort of bringing, uh, you know, a, a richness to uh, the existing work on people's history because it's so, so severely lacking, right? Um, and, and for us too, it's, it's really, sometimes we don't even know what we don't know because there's so much out there uh, that we're not um, exposed to uh, because of the kinds of very, like you said, very selective um, history making that, that is happening here. Uh, Hyung Hong uh, makes a comment. She said, from what, what, from what I get from Valerie, oral, oral narratives uh, not only construct identity, but also produces power. Would, would you like to say anything about that? Um, well, the oral histories are kind of a powerful instrument for the narrator to they give a platform for his prestige and status and for recalling all his ancestral allies, all his kinship. And so it's a platform for the narrator and they give him standing within the community. And when I look at value and values, I can show how the telling of the oral uh, narratives are an instrument for his maintaining his standing and his status within the community. Um, but of course, as a leader, um, when he talks about uh, his genealogies, he then talks about being not particularly wealthy and how important it is for him to be a servant of the people um, and how he works for the good of the community. And so he's undercutting his building up of his status by an expression of humility, which I think is pretty typical of a narrator or a bard of Southeast Asian narratives. They always perhaps, um, preface what they're saying with an expression of humility so they don't get knocked down by somebody else. Um, but on top of that, the oral narratives act in a way of reinforcing a value system and bringing people together. And that's um, quite, an important, quite an important thing. Just the act of hearing of being able to relate to um, the narratives and the ancestors brings in a wide network of people across from the highlands to the coastal cities, to KL, and eventually to members of the Longhouse who live in England. 
you know, and, and that's a way of creating a net of people listening and community. And do these stories continue to be passed down and retold or perhaps retold in different, uh, recorded in different genres, aside from cassette tapes now? I, I think less so because there's TV in the longhouse. And interestingly, TV tends to be, um, people are not getting Malaysian TV, but they're getting Indonesian TV and they're getting Indonesian um, Christian channels and people are, there's less time to tell stories. But I think over the 10 years that I've been visiting, these stories have gone around in people's heads a lot. So there has been some retelling and particularly certain parts. And what has revived that? Then, I suppose my going back and asking questions, but throughout the Highlands, there's been a revival of interest in the megalithic culture, in documenting megaliths. There've been teams of archeologists going in, asking people about stories about the megaliths. So, and there have been, um, with logging coming in and road building, there's been a need for people to want to identify markers of land and territory. And so the exercise of documenting play ancestral places and fruit trees has been a very important exercise for people. So there is that interest in, um, signs and traces of the past, the topoi, shall we say, or what the Calabic call a tomb, marks on the landscape. Wonderful. So that's been um, interesting to see this revival of interest. And I, I also see it, I, I know, um, you know, you through your writing and you, your daughter who's also here uh, through her music, right? And I, I saw a, a Calabit, um, uh, uh, an effort to also collect uh, songs uh, from children's songs, which I, I think is also great to see these kinds of different genres of oral history that's being uh, captured. And I think you're, you're sort of interested also doing creative nonfiction. So that maybe that will be another genre yeah. of stories being retold for, to the next generation. Uh, we have a question from Noor uh, Shazrina. Uh, so do you agree that the only way for Malaysia to achieve national integration, especially between Peninsula and East, is to include stories from Sarawak and Sabah? Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely include stories, film, animation, get people to come here. We go there. I think a different kind of tourism is needed as well. Mm. Different kind of tourism, different ways of visiting, different ways of being together, listening to one another's stories. Yeah, definitely. Diana, you wanted to add to that sort of the idea of national integration and the role of um, perhaps yeah, well, maybe maybe national integration is not quite the right word, or not the word that I would. Uh, I, I think, as I said, we have to, I, I think uh, Valerie really taught us, I mean, official history is a source of power, but it's also a source of solidarity. You cast a wide network uh, of people who listen to the same stories, maybe we do need national stories. Um, but these stories uh, do not need to be integrated and uniform. I think maybe that, that, that was what I was trying to say when, when I said, you know, we, we should look at uh, official history. We should not reject the notion of official history. Uh, of a, of, a, of, a his, of a narrative of, that confers power. All narratives confer power. If you confer voice, you confer power. 
um, but we should seek toward, and I don't know how to do it, but maybe that's part of the discussion that we're having of how, how to uh, bring different narratives at different levels into a dialectical relationship with each other, a dialogical and a dialectical relationship with, with one another, and thereby allowing both that process of remembering in which voice acquires power, as well as that process of forgetting, which may be necessary because like Valerie says, I mean, the history, history, real history, living history, or living, the living present is not full of harmony. There has been conflict. There has been headhunting in, in I don't know what, in, in, in the Borneo and Highlands was very much a part of that history. Different tribes fought each other. Um, so a process of forgetting may be necessary. And in fact, what we would want to do would be to, to have a process of forgetting based on dialogue and, 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 and based on dialogue and, and, and conversation and narratives rather than based solely on the practice of suppression, which is what, which is how national uh, history and official history has been constituted most of the time so far. I think what we're trying to do is to, is to when, when we speak of a history from below, not just as concept, but as methodology, is to work toward a, a method of, to, toward that kind of dial, of a dialogic relationship between different types of stories, different types of narratives, and different types of conversations. Um, and I wouldn't put the word integration at the center of that. It's not integrating stories, it's providing space for different types of stories to yeah. confront. Yeah. And to learn from each other. Yeah. Mm. And through that process, I think Valerie said, you know, that uh, listening to stories together, having an audience that listens, mm. it's a very powerful experience and a very powerful moment in the, in the generation of identity, of collective identity, and maybe eventually of, get, of forgetting. And, and, and I think that's why I think it's not just narratives. What we need is also conversations, yeah. both as anthropological method, but also as, mm. as a civic method yeah. of mm. constructing a, 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 a national history. Okay, Hyung Hong here says, allowing conflicting narratives is democratizing space for different narratives. Mm -hmm. So creating uh, a more democratic space for different narratives. All right, we're kind of um, at the end of our time, but I mean, I'd like to allow space for Valerie if you'd like to uh, pick up on any of those um, remaining comments and like to say anything about uh, the work that you're doing or where you like to see it. I really enjoyed this session. Um, there's not, everyone's just been making some very important points. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I didn't know the existence of people who were interested in oral history in anywhere in Malaysia. So that's why I, I resorted to the Austronesian narratives, shall we say. I did come across some useful books that I think had been written in Singapore. Um, which I, I quoted from, but um, I really feel for the study of history in Malaysia as a subject, both in schools and at universities. And I'd like to see some kind of revival and regeneration of history as a subject. Um, I feel quite passionate about it and I'm not quite sure where we start. 
maybe I, I, I was going to say that we had close, but there was one, one comment here maybe that I just like to read um, by Chong Li Yo, who said, in my humble view, including stories from the people of Sabah and Sarawak can be one of the better, one of the ways to create great, greater understanding between people, but not the ultimate way. We might want to question the power, social and economic, economical dynamics that play in between the peninsula and Malaysian Borneo. Why exclusion took place um, at the first place, for instance? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very great, great point uh, that you're making, uh, Leo. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, so I think uh, we'll, we'll just a few, I just saw another comment came. Okay, just like the ending comment. Um, all right, with that, thank you so much uh, to uh, Dr. Vary Mashman for really great. Thank you so much for sharing your work. I mean, the, it has so much value. It's so rich. And not only that you shared with us sort of, you know, your thick ethnography, but you also shared with us sort of your reflection of the process, which I think. Uh, for a lot of us who are researchers, it's something that we're constantly struggling with, but sometimes we don't have the space or time, or we don't create that time to sort of really reflect on some of these um, issues that some are ethical, some are methodological. Um, so thank you so much, um, uh, Valerie, for, for sharing your, your really amazing work. And thank you so much, Diana, for, as usual, your very um, succinct, um, uh, commentary, uh, which just creates more questions uh, for us to ponder and think about and also uh, raise some important issues that we could sort of look uh, and, and talk about together uh, sort of in, 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 in other spaces as well. So thank you everyone who participated. Um, and uh, I think both Valley and, 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 and uh, Diana, um, you know, are I'm, I'm just volunteering you to Diana o open to also if people have any questions or comments to be in touch as well. Thank you everyone have a great uh, night and uh, we'll see you next month next month we have Razan Rosman who will be uh, talking about the use of visual images uh, in understanding um, 1930s uh, Malay cosmo, cosmopolitan aspirations. So that uh, will be quite interesting moving from oral history to looking at visual imagery. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Valerie and Diana and to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Very thank, you thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Valerie. Thank, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Rusa Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.